A very good evening to one and all of you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajesh, and thanks to the AIOS for having provided us the first national ambassadors with uh, this platform for sharing um, this capsule on uh, dry eye disease. So whenever you talk about a disease, you uh, start at the very beginning. And the definition of the disease should be able to give you the gist of the entire disease in a single sentence. And the classification should give you a broad overview and perspective of the disease in its entirety. Uh, for the uninitiated, uh, the T4 views to steering committee basically wanted to provide an evidence-based approach and a process of open communication, dialogue and transparency in order to achieve a consensus concerning multiple aspects of dry eye disease. And uh, just as mentioned by Dr. Sanwan, there were 12 subcommittees and the ones which have been highlighted in color are the ones that we are going to be talking about today and I will be focusing on the definition and classification subcommittee. And this subcommittee basically aimed to create an evidence-based definition and a contemporary classification system for dry eye disease. So what exactly did they do? They started from the previous dry eye definitions and classification schemes, making revisions to address what were perceived as shortcomings in the earlier versions using a consensus-based manner. And the members supported the need for a change in the definition as well as a more simpler definition, one that would help us differentiate dry eye disease from other ocular surface diseases, that would resolve confusion between diagnostic versus pathophysiological features, acknowledge the multitude of etiological triggers, and recognize the role of neurosensory abnormalities in dry eye disease. So this was the uh, revised definition that was drafted by the t 4s used to. And when you read it like this and look at it like this, it appears as dry as the disease that it aims to define. So let's make it more simpler and a little more interesting to understand what each and every word in this definition means. So it was decided to carry on the terminology of uh, dry eye, despite the fact that you have paradoxical wet dry eyes in a majority of these patients, mainly because the term dry eye had already gained significant global recognition and acceptance. It's multifactorial because there's no single characteristic sign or symptom that defines this condition, nor is there a single etiopathological factor of this particular topic that we are discussing. Uh, considering the impact of um, the condition on the end organ uh, that uh, it causes, especially with respect to the structure and function, uh, this does qualify for the terminology of being called as uh, disease. And of course, the end organ itself, which is affected, which is the ocular surface, accompanied by ocular symptoms which does not qualify the ocular symptoms in this definition, whereas in the previous version, you had specifically uh, the visual disturbances and discomfort that was mentioned as part of the ocular symptoms. Therefore, keeping this open-ended in order to include a wide variety of manifestations of symptoms that these patients usually present with. The subcommittee was actually very tempted to stop the definition of dry eye with just the first half of what is actually described, but they decided to have the second half to the definition, mainly to emphasize that these four factors, tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities, they play etiological roles and they are not mandatory diagnostic criteria as was misinterpreted from the earlier version of the definition which was given in the TFOS DUES 1 report. And of course, the central pathophysiological concept of the entire definition lay in this phrase, loss of homeostasis of the tear pill. And if you look at the evolution of the definition of dry eye over the years, disorder became disease, tear film, hyperosmolarity, and ocular surface inflammation changed from being mandatory diagnostic criteria to having causal etiologic roles. And the phrase loss of homeostasis is something new which has been added. 
So once we've actually understood the definition in its entirety, I think we can proceed forward to understanding the classification of dry eye disease, which again uh, has undergone an evolution over the years. But if you look at the earlier classifications, may it be in 1995 or in 2007, what was basically done was that it was classified into aqueous deficient and evaporative dry eye disease, which again gave a misperception that a particular patient had to be fitted into one of these two categories. The concept of having a mixed variety or a hybrid dry disease did not exist and was not made clear in the previous definition or the classification of uh, dry eye and especially to address this this misperception of mutual exclusivity of dry eye disease subtypes and in addition accommodate patients with a conflict between signs and symptoms which is what we normally see when we are examining patients of dry eye in our OPT and also to include an option for a diagnosis of so-called normal the classification system was refined because ultimately the aim or purpose of classifying any disease is to improve patient care and when you look at the classification that was provided by the TFOS due to report again when you take a look at it like this it appears to be very daunting so let's again break it down into smaller components and start from the bottom which is what we are more familiar with the uh, division of dry eye disease into aqueous deficient and evaporative dry eye but it is made very clear here theoretically visually and pictorially that these are not watertight compartments and you can have patients who belong to either of these categories and you can very well have what is called as a hybrid dry eye disease so once we've understood this let's look at the upper portion of the chart and break this down further it's only this one particular drop down which leads you to the diagnosis of dry eye disease. So these are patients who have both symptoms as well as signs of ocular surface disease. But are they always dry eye? Well, we shall look at it in a little um, uh, later in these slides. But when you have symptoms and signs, then they qualify for being termed as dry eye disease. When you look at the right corner, these are patients who are symptomatic but have no signs. So what does that mean? Either that these patients are yet to develop signs of dry eye, which means that this is a preclinical state of dry eye and possibly if you keep following up these patients over a period of time, they would develop signs and therefore become uh, qualified to be termed as patients who have dry eye disease. But they could also be another category over here where these are patients who could probably be suffering from neuropathic pain and they would have to be referred appropriately for pain management. Coming to the left side, you have patients who could be absolutely asymptomatic, who do not complain of anything and you pick up the signs of ocular surface disease during the routine examination or during your preoperative screening. So these are patients who have no symptoms, but they have signs, which indicates that they are predisposed to dry eye. And under this, you also have the category of neurotrophic conditions, which explains the significant disparity between signs and symptoms. And on the extreme left is uh, the group of patients who are neither symptomatic nor have signs who are termed as normal and who obviously require no treatment. This particular group of patients has got more relevance, especially when you're conducting epidemiological studies or clinical trials and not exactly important from the clinical perspective where we are more interested in the patients who actually have a problem. And below each box, you have the particular subcommittee report that you need to refer to in case you want to go further with respect to understanding of what needs to be done further for that particular patient. So this is the classification that was proposed by the um, TFOS DUCE 2 report. And like I said, when you have patients who present to you with both symptoms and signs, it is not always necessary that they should only belong to the dry eye disease category. And here comes the importance of what is called as triaging questions, where you have a list of questions that are asked to the patient, which helps you differentiate between dry eye disease and mimics of dry eye disease. And once you have experienced 
excluded those and you suspect dry eye, you do a risk factor analysis and then you run these patients through the entire uh, diagnostic methodology which is going to be dealt with in detail by Dr. Baskar in the talk subsequently which brings you to the end point where you will be able to put these patients into a category of either aqueous dry eye or uh, the evaporative dry eye or the mixed variety and once you have that categorization there is another exhaustive list of differential diagnosis under each of these categories which will help you narrow down your diagnosis uh, in that particular patient based on the history and the investigations both ocular as well as systemic which brings us to just a couple of slides on the pathophysiology of um, dry eye disease wherein the TFOS primarily has been advocating through both its reports that be it aqueous dry eye or be it evaporative dry eye the one final common pathway of dry eye disease is the tear hyperosmolarity which leads to the other uh, effects and um, uh, manifestations that you see in these patients. Also very beautifully elaborated in this report are the various sources of dry eye symptoms and the causes for each of the symptoms that these patients present to you with. Of course, when you have a definition, when you have a classification system, there will always be another group or another um, team that comes out with another definition or classification with which you will have to compare and contrast the uh, definition that you have proposed and the one significant group which has a slightly different viewpoint is the Asia dry eye study group which defines dry eye slightly differently where they state that it is the unstable tear film which is pivotal and um, unlike hyperosmolarity which is proposed by the uh, TFOS and they go more by the breakup patterns in patients with dry eye which has given rise to their thought process of tear film oriented diagnosis and tear film oriented therapy in contrast to the due to uh, diagnosis and classification and concept of treatment which is what I have tried to highlight in this particular slide. So this brings us to the fact that there are of course unmet needs starting right from the definition. It's only when you have these differences it's probably because of the fact that you have geographical variations you have maybe ethnic differences you have manifestations of the disease which are different in different parts of the world and therefore there is what we call as unmet needs of dry eye which not only uh, exists as far as the definition of the disease is concerned but we probably also need to work on algorithms to help us narrow the diagnosis down further. You're going to be hearing about investigational tools, but we need to understand their relevance, the need and the inference of what we derive from these various investigations and how to apply them clinically, as well as more research with respect to the various management options which are in the pipeline with respect to this particular disease that talk which will be dealt with in the subsequent talks. So to conduct definition and classification of the disease is concerned, what it helps us do is categorize patients into whether you have dry eye disease or whether you're normal, you have other ocular surface disorders which could be mimics, whether you have neuropathic pain, neurotrophic keratitis, or whether it's a preclinical dry eye. If it's dry eye disease, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic which justifies the conflict between signs and symptoms and helps you categorize these patients into subtypes, aqueous deficient dry eye, evaporative dry eye, or hybrid disease. And what all this basically aims, that this particular approach is not really intended to override our clinical assessment or judgment, but rather it helps guide clinical management and future research. With this, I conclude my talk, and I thank you all for a very patient hearing. Thank you.